Well, I'm from the Caribbean, and carnival initially established itself in the Eastern Caribbean, especially in Trinidad and Tobago and the neighboring islands, partly through the influence of the Catholic Church. Um, normally, they would have uh, some sort of letting down of uh, the hair, or um, and um, that would be the part of the pre-Lent uh, celebrations to anticipate the privations of, of the Lent itself. However, I was born in Jamaica, and Jamaica being a British colony, they had no carnival as such. It never did establish itself, partly because of the um, absence of any Catholic Church influence. And so, as a result, I grew up in Jamaica without any um, experience of carnival at all. In fact, um, Jamaica, by the time I was born, had been almost um, a British colony for 300 years, uh, compared to Trinidad, which was only from 1802. So uh, that would have been almost uh, a hundred, over 100 years less. So, uh, in fact, I had absolutely no influence, no experience of carnival before coming to England. Yes, it's ironic that it's in England that I uh, came in contact with, with carnival, with the Notting Hill Carnival, in fact. And um, I remember, I think it was 1977, I went to one of the early carnivals. It was just really getting on the way. And there had been several before that, but this particular one was very well attended for the first time. And um, I think partly because there was a local radio station, which was uh, um, broadcasting music from the, from the area. And um, it attracted a lot of people for the first time. And it was a very, very um, glorious occasion. There was a, a lot of um, music, they had stalls, you know, the, the kind of things you have now. But then it was more of a, of a novelty. And uh, in those days as well, it was mainly the steel band music from Trinidad, which is far more, in my opinion, far more joyful and, and so on than the later kind of heavy Jamaican type music that came in. And um, yeah, I remember it being a fantastic occasion. And so much so that when I, when I got home, I thought, this is amazing. This is a kind of a, something in, British, in Britain, which was specifically Caribbean. And I thought that could be celebrated. And that's why I came up with the idea of writing a children's book called Nini at Carnival about a, 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 a little girl who doesn't have a costume at the start of the carnival. She's very upset and her friends managed to conjure up a kind of makeshift uh, carnival costume for her. And they all pretend that she's really the queen of the carnival. So she's very happy at the end of it all and never guesses that what her friends have done. And um, it wasn't until maybe a decade later that I moved to the area that I now live in, northwest London, which is within walking distance of the Notting Hill Carnival. And then I began to, to go to that carnival, and then I then saw the potential of the kind of uh, images that I was seeing becoming a source of material for paintings. And I started off on a fairly modest scale doing uh, watercolors, in a kind of, in a, in a sketch pad or drawing, on drawing paper. And um, I had intended it to be quite a kind of modest exercise because uh, I was doing it mainly to kind of keep my hand in while I was writing a teenage novel. I didn't want to sort of lose contact with, with painting. And then it kind of escalated from there. So I moved from doing um, sketches, watercolors, to doing oil paintings, there again also on a small scale. And then later on, I kind of um, graduated, <laughs> to put it that way, to bigger paintings. And the, the, the painting behind and as, is an example of the type of paintings I've been doing, which are a bit more demanding than uh, the sketches, both watercolor and oil sketches that I was doing 
hitherto. When I came to England, I didn't come as an art student. I came as a law student, and that is what I studied. It took me a bit longer than the average person because I got kind of sidestepped halfway through and got involved in painting. And in those days, you could, it was a very gentlemanly affair with the Inns of Court. You could do your exams um, at your leisure for the part one. You could take one, one per year if you, if you wanted. You could do Roman law one year, constitutional law the next, criminal law the next, and so on. So, but when it came to the finals, you had to do them all 11 subjects at one go. So anyway, um, in the first part of um, that, my, my years as a law student, I got involved in painting, and uh, not so much painting, but involved with sculpture. And um, I had a few commissions to do some well-known figures, like the, there's the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Sir Alexander Bustamante, and Gary Sobers, the, the cricketer, um, Lord Pitt, um, and um, quite a few distinguished car people from the Caribbean. And uh, so when CAM was formed in 1966, that's all I had to show, really. I, I hadn't got involved in painting yet. And um, so that, in fact, helped to change my life because I was then able to meet people from the artistic community from the Caribbean painters and sculptors. Also, I was able to meet people who were poets and playwrights and so on, because CAM was a very broad-based organization, which not only had artists, but it also had you know, um, professional people, intellectuals, and ordinary you know, people uh, who had uh, none of those kind of um, credentials. So uh, it, yeah, it did actually make me open my eyes to another type of life and another type of potential lifestyle which appealed to me much more than being a practicing lawyer. So uh, eventually I, I got involved in, um, in that, in CAM, and later on I then discovered that if you wanted to make your way as an artist you could not rely on getting commissions to do bronze busts. So I then started to paint but by the time I started to paint, it was really at the very end of CAM. I started to paint in 1971, 72, by which time CAM was really scaling down. But uh, at any rate, my involvement with CAM was a very, very um, significant factor in my life. And um, I've since then, those days, kept in touch with quite a lot of the people who were members of CAM including people like Paul Dash and um, John LaRose and Kamal Brathwaite and so on. Andrew Salki as well, who we, those were the founders of CAM. I, there was not one person who was a member of CAM who was not born in the Caribbean. You know, they were virtually from the 1970s. There were no um, young art students emerging from British colleges. And it wasn't until uh, the 1980s that you began to have young people coming through. And um, that made a big difference because they began to make their voices heard, especially um, uh, women as well were coming through, whereas CAM, they had very few women artists. So uh, my practice was somewhat different, really. I wasn't dealing with the kind of issues which would be considered of relevance to British um, institutions, you know. Um, and we didn't have much to do with like, confronting racism or sexism or any of those issues which uh, a lot of the young black students were engaged with. So. Uh, yeah, it wasn't until much later on, actually, that uh, people like Aubrey Williams and um, Ronald Moody, for instance, or even Winston Branch, who was a bit younger than they were, were able to have their works um, purchased by the Arts Council or by, the, or by Tate Britain. In fact, it, uh, there wasn't a... 
kind of mainstream exhibition of, of their work until after they had died. Yeah, so it goes to show that, um, first of all, that the attitudes have changed somewhat and their work has been sort of retrospectively taken into account. But um, prior to that, you know, so we from, the, from CAM uh, had to make our own exhibitions actually. Um, there were no outlets in mainstream organizations. So a lot of the exhibitions were um, ad hoc, you know, really not properly curated, just paintings being hung for a weekend or a week and so on. And also one other thing with CAM, um, it was really primarily to do with organizations, with um, writers and you know, poets, um, novelists, playwrights and so on. They were the ones who were really in the forefront. And artists was a bit more problematic because for a start, it was very difficult for us to replicate our work in the newsletter. There was no chance using a guest statement to have a full color picture. So um, we were very much um, at the mercy of when it was possible to mount an exhibition. And even then, there were no kind of accredited um, art critics and so on who could make assessment of the work. So we were really at quite an, a, a disadvantage compared to the writers and, and so on who had access to print, which is what the, what the newsletters um, were about, just mainly print. Well, it was quite an interesting exercise trying to find works from the Fitzwilliam collection and from the Kettlesard collection that resonated with the theme of carnival. And that was because uh, there were very few examples from either collection which was specifically on, the, on, on, on point, specifically on the theme of carnival. Those came from the Fitzwilliam collection and in fact dated back quite a while because uh, apart from one particular one, which I'll talk about later on, they were all uh, going back to, I would have thought, the 18th, 19th century and not at all modern. And um, I don't think there were any at all in the Kettlesard collection. So at an early stage, a decision had to be made. How can one connect the theme of carnival with paintings which were not explicitly, explicitly on the theme of carnival? And that is when uh, the decision was made to look at what could be considered to be the essence of carnival. Uh, maybe color, um, the dynamic um, composition, and um, anything which showed a movement and that sort of thing. And in fact, that helped to deepen the response to the whole theme of carnival. It really widened it out and um, made it a much more rich exhibition, I would have thought, than had all the works been just to do with the theme of carnival, whether it's carnival from Venice or from Dublin or from any other part of the world, Brazil or Trinidad or what have you. And I think that is one of the things which I think will resonate, I think also with, with visitors. They will be able to look at the abstract paintings, for instance, many of them are abstract, which have these qualities and then begin to also look at carnival as well in a slightly different light and just to see some of the deeper things that go into the planning and the thinking behind carnival um, floats and carnival um, exhibitions. Uh, one of the works that really interested me was titled The Opens Arriving at the Condor's Party and uh, it was really um, a bit ambivalent because it was difficult to know for sure who was arriving at whose party? Who were the opens and who were the convicts? But uh, I came down uh, to the conclusion that in fact it was the, the convicts who were the um, ones to the right. And um, uh, part of that reason was because of the curtains. There seemed to be a pair of curtains which were parted and the opens seemed to have been dressed more 
appropriately for carnival, whereas the hosts seemed to be in dress very awkward, very, very um, strange kind of way. And it made for um, a kind of ambiguity, really, because it wasn't clear what was exactly was happening. And um, the other one which was of interest was by an artist from India called Avinash Chandra, which was an um, abstract painting. And um, that particular work had virtually all the elements that would expect in a carnival painting, which was um, excitement, dynamism, um, movement. You got the feeling that the figures in that particular uh, abstract work were actually um, human, although you couldn't be sure, but I, I got the feeling that some of those um, features there were humans, and it was called Black Feast, and uh, with a feast you expect to, be, they expect to be some form of consumption of food or drink or what have you. And so it was easy to read into that particular uh, painting some of those human elements, which would be very typical of um, the kind of uh, indulgence you would have in pre-Lent um, celebrations before Carnival. So there was that kind of connection, and I thought that was quite an interesting juxtaposition of um, ideas. Well, the notion of being in an exhibition with uh, great painters like Picasso, Bruegel, Frank and Haler, um, is very interesting exercise because what it does is that it creates a kind of uh, environment where there is an element of almost um, equality, <laughs> if you like. And um, to have your work beside those painters means, in a way, that when people come to the gallery and have a look at these works, I think they're more tempted to, to see them for what they are and um, to see the, the human elements rather than to see a famous painter as opposed to being juxtaposed with less, less known painters. It's a kind of leveler to a certain extent. And uh, I think it's one of the big developments I would have thought in terms of the works of black artists being shown alongside famous white artists, where you don't have uh, a kind of uh, survey type exhibition involving exclusively black artists, but you have uh, a kind of a more, um, almost more natural kind of uh, juxtaposition of works of art without necessarily any reference to the ethnicity of, of the artists. And I think that, um, that I, that, that I would have thought is quite a recent development. Certainly has been happening in the past. I was involved in one exhibition um, at the Milton Keynes Gallery um, several years ago in which I was able to have my work shown alongside that of Henry Moore and um, Gainsborough and I don't think... Uh, and um, Barbara Hepworth and so on, although they, they, they were invariably less um, major works of these artists. Um, it was still a very um, good exercise, and one I think that um, most artists would be quite glad and pleased to have their work shown alongside great artists, certainly a source of encouragement as well. Yes, the um, question of art from the Caribbean and its relationship to uh, the Metropolitan. It's a very tricky one, actually. I've just been reading a book called What is, uh, what is Black Art? And um, at the end of it, of course, I'm no wiser to a certain extent because it's a very um, tricky subject. Um, in the Caribbean, the um, first exposure to art that we would have had would have been from would have been European art, would have been the work of um, people from Europe who were either colonizers or visitors doing um, water, uh, watercolors quite more often than not, and, uh, or local 
scenery, um, portraits of people and so on. So it was quite natural that a kind of European sensibility in art established itself. And there were some exceptions, I think, mainly with um, what you might call naive painters or what in Jamaica is called intuitive painters who departed to a certain extent from the European canon. But uh, by the time there was real local involvement with the development of art in the Caribbean in the early part of the 20th century, um, it was already very much along the lines of European art. And in fact, the Jamaican School of Art, for instance, which was established in the 1960s, uh, was very much typical of art colleges anywhere else in Europe where you had emphasis on life drawings and things like that, and using the same materials, um, whether it be watercolor, or oil paints, or green sculpture, and with very much the same kind of gallery ambience and exposure and all that. Now, I think there was a kind of a change of emphasis when people from the Caribbean came to, Eng came to Britain and to, um, to Europe generally. And uh, I think one of, the, um, one of the big things was that that kind of movement tended to coincide with um, political independence. And so people from the Caribbean were thinking in terms of trying to develop a kind of separate identity through art and, and having things which were more less imitative and more authentically your own. Uh, that was much easier in music, for instance, or even literature, where you could use local language, you could use local setting and so on. But in the context of Britain, it was quite uh, problematic in art to have uh, that same, um, that, that difference, if you like. And um, that's one of the reasons why it is very difficult to establish the credentials of black art as being separate from European art. Because if you paint a black person, of course, that doesn't make it black art. Uh, and um, in any case, you do have instances of white artists painting black people. So it would, it would, um, they would not then be creating black art, would they? So it's, it's a bit tricky. And uh, on the other hand, if people were then to concentrate on, say, looking for models elsewhere, from Africa, for instance, that would also not necessarily bring the artists from the Caribbean in line with modern sort of practice and um, expression. So it's very tricky, actually. And um, I think that um, with time, it, it will probably become less and less significant to itemize works as being black or being white or being European or Caribbean or what have you. And um, I think if we want to look, with, there might be a parallel in music, for instance, where if you were to look at the music of, say, Tamla Motown, or look at the music of the Four Tops or the Impressions or any of those, um, or the drifters, any of those groups, and you analyze it, you will see that really the, the, um, key, that they, the, the, the key that they were using would be the um, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, the, 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 what you call the diatonic scale. Uh, so, I mean, I, yeah, the scale they would be using would be the diatonic scale. And, um, at the same time, they didn't necessarily have drums or the, the rhythm was not necessarily particularly African. And especially the groups I mentioned, a lot of them had strings, violins and all the rest of it. But at the same time, it would be almost um, sacrilegious to say that this wasn't black music because there was another element in that music which resonated with, um, with black people. And I think with art as well, I think one has to maybe use that same kind of a criteria where you might have a subject matter painted by a black artist, which um, is not necessarily radically different from what European art would be. 
but where we have some element which you could say it's like almost like soul art. <laughs> so you could use maybe a different word to signify that there's some element there which um, people will recognize as, being, as reflecting their particular experience or their particular lifestyle or whatever. Because carnival has been associated with letting your hair down before, before Lent and um, generally indulging in the type of behavior that you would normally consider, especially if you're wearing a mask and you had the element of anonymity, um, then you could understand how it came about that um, carnivals became, in, in, in most countries where it was celebrated, quite raucous and uh, would have elements which uh, would be not considered particularly delicate. <laughs> Uh, from my um, um, experience, I found it really quite challenging to accept the notion, coming from Jamaica as I did from a kind of bourgeois background, that I would ever go in the street and be dancing in the street and holding my hands up and carrying on as if I were from Trinidad or, 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 or uh, one of those islands or one of those countries that really let go when it comes to carnival. And also there's um, an element as well which I found quite challenging, which is the sexuality, which is inherent in a lot of the movements, the gyrations, the winding up and all that, which you find uh, as a part of, of carnival. And I think that um, that is part of what could be considered the wild spirit of carnival. And I think it is a part of the human psyche, human nature, that balanced out with this whole business of uh, being very holy and well-behaved during Lent, that in order to, to prepare for that, you're going to go wild in the weeks or months before. And um, I remember, too, that uh, I read somewhere that the efforts of some um, local authorities or governments and so on to curtail tournament carnival and to make it a bit more respectable has been really very um, strongly opposed because there is this feeling that this is a time for us to kind of let go, for ordinary people to express themselves, to take control of the streets for instance and to become uh, free from being controlled. You know, it's like a, a few weeks or a few days of um, liberation in a kind of way, although a lot of it would have been just in the imagination. And that's why you find a lot of the costumes to do with carnivals are like people power dressing. They're putting on the uniforms of Aztecs or some kind of a previous conquistador or emperor or something to, which changes their status and make them become a bit greater than they would be normally. And uh, so, for instance, you will find that the notion, which was um, mooted, I think, by local authorities in, in London and by the government or by the police, to move the carnival from the streets of Notting Hill into Hyde Park, which is more contained, and you could then, uh, it would be the commercializing of, commercialization of carnival, as well as the control of it, and would take away the kind of power that ordinary people felt they had in coming out and expressing themselves on the streets. So that is really um, uh, an expression that there is this kind of groundswell of belief that that particular period uh, leading up to carnival, even in London where it's no longer religiously based, it's in August and it's completely secular, there is a feeling that this is our time. People feel that they should have the space and the freedom to just take over the streets for a couple of days and to enjoy themselves and to let go. And I think that has had the impact of popularizing certain other elements of Caribbean culture, like the food and the music, and just generally the kind of uh, lifestyle. And so nowadays, everybody knows about jerk chicken or curry goat and things like that. 
and um, it's broadening out. And in time to come, it's very difficult to predict how this carnival will spread and how it will be expressed outside of um, Nottingham Gate, uh, outside of the kind of centers of um, town centers or city centers where you have um, black populations. It's going to spread much wider and I think that would be very interesting to see. I hope I live long enough to see some of that.